Um, hi, welcome uh, to this event tonight. My name is Katie Burkholder Harris. I'm the executive director of the Alliance to End Homelessness in Ottawa. And we're really, really happy that you're coming out for this event to talk about how we can stop the loss of existing affordable housing. Um, I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement. I'm tuning in virtually from Ottawa. Um, I know folks may be coming from lots of different places, but in Ottawa, we are actually located on unceded Algonquin and Anishinaabeg territory. Um, and put simply, these lands were stolen from the traditional keepers uh, for the purposes of settlers. Disposition of land is just one form of ongoing colonization um, that has led to First Nations, Inuit and Métis people disproportionately experiencing homelessness. Research shows that Indigenous peoples in Ottawa account for 20 to 50% of people experiencing homelessness here. So we are grateful for the work of Indigenous scholar Jesse Thistle because he's defined homelessness differently as experienced by people who are Indigenous. Um, he describes 12 dimensions of Indigenous homelessness and it makes clear the connection between historical and ongoing colonization and the over-representation of Indigenous people in homelessness. So to truly have an impact on ending homelessness in our community, we need to lead with this knowledge. Embracing Indigenous leadership, collaboration is crucial to ensuring the prevention, reduction, and ultimately the end of homelessness. We support the call for a fully funded Indigenous housing strategy, um, which is a key piece people have been advocating for for quite some time, and Indigenous-led governance for this work. This acknowledgement is a reminder of the responsibility that we have to Indigenous peoples and a commitment to reconciliation. So we really appreciate your being here tonight. I know there's been a lot of interest in this uh, meeting and I think really in this topic. And I think it's something that people have been speaking about, but we're so excited to have the three panelists here tonight who can speak to this in pretty wide terms. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. John Silvest, who's co-hosting with me tonight and uh, over to you, John. Thank you, Katie. Yeah, uh, certainly uh, I'm very, very thrilled to see so many of you uh, joining us, us this evening. Uh, uh, I'm John Silvest. I'm a senior researcher at the Center for Research on Educational and Community Services at the University of Ottawa, and a professor in the Faculty of Social Sciences there. Um, just a little bit about our center. We uh, established in uh, 2000. Uh, we collaborate in research and evaluation and training with organizations in the educational, social service, uh, and health sectors. Our aim ultimately is to improve social programs and policies for citizens, especially those uh, facing uh, social inclusion. Um, we have about 40 affiliated researchers at the faculty, uh, and mainly in the Faculty of Social Sciences and Education, and we study a broad range of talk, topics including uh, social innovation, digital citizenship, services for people with intellectual disabilities, child welfare, but uh, a main focus of ours has been on uh, supportive housing uh, and uh, homelessness, and we're particularly proud of our uh, long-standing uh, partnership and collaboration with the Alliance to End Homelessness. Uh, we've been pleased to support the Alliance uh, in its uh, research days, along with uh, prior involvement supporting the Alliance uh, back in the days of the report cards and uh, progress reports on homelessness uh, in the city. Uh, and, we've, and we're also proud to uh, have worked with a large number of the uh, members of the Alliance as well in our research and evaluation projects. Uh, this evening, uh, we're particularly pleased uh, to provide uh, our endorsement uh, and our support uh, for the Alliance's uh, campaign that you're going to hear about uh, this evening. Looking forward to seeing these themes uh, as they animate our discussions in the upcoming municipal elections. And I, along I'm sure with many of you, am eagerly looking to learn uh, much from our participants this evening. So uh, thank you. Back to you, Katie. And thanks so much for sponsoring the the um, the campaign starts with home. I know that's how a lot of people heard about this event in the first place. So really, over the last year, um, the Alliance has worked with many, many community partners, other advocacy groups, experts uh, in the field of housing and homelessness and developed a campaign with three pretty simple messages. The first is stopping the loss of the existing affordable housing that we do have, which we'll be focusing on tonight. The second is the need to create more affordable housing, especially nonprofit housing. And the third is preserving the quality of, of housing, both in the private market and the public market. And we really think a key piece of that is having a human rights-based approach to how we do that. 
Um, so tonight we're really excited to focus on that first piece, stopping the loss, because it's often the one that is not talked about um, when it comes to housing and homelessness issues. Starts With Home is meant to build public and political support for the upcoming municipal election in Ottawa. We want to get a city council that is committed to ending homelessness, to creating more affordable housing so that everybody can have a place to live in this city. Sahar is really going to let, lay the groundwork of what's actually happening in our system, in our market, um, about why housing is so expensive and why we continue to lose existing affordable units. And so the number that's going around on the chat, thank you to all the experts, uh, seven to one. In Ottawa, we lose seven uh, units of affordable housing um, for every one that is purpose-built. So uh, nationally, it's 15 to one, but we really want to focus on how we can stop that loss of our existing supply. So over to you, John. I'm very, very pleased to welcome Tahir Reza, who is the uh, project manager of the uh, National Right to Housing Network, a group of over uh, 350 organizations and advocates dedicated to ending homelessness and the housing uh, need across Canada through the meaningful implementation of the right to adequate housing. As a daughter of immigrants and activists, uh, she has been working to engage and elevate the racialized and marginalized voices for as long as she can remember. She holds a master's in uh, communication and has spent a decade researching and mobilizing knowledge about intersectional Canadian issues rooted in colonialism, systematic discrimination, and privatization. She now brings that lens to her work at the NRHN. So please, uh, looking forward to your presentation, Sahar. Thank you so much, John, and, and thank you, Katie, and everyone for just uh, having me participate in this uh, really important discussion today. Just bear with me as I figure out how to share my screen here. Uh, can you see it? Oh. Yes, we can. Uh, brilliant. Okay. Um, so yeah, I'm very glad to be chatting with you today about I mean, I'm not glad about the loss of affordable housing, but unfortunately, this isn't a unique issue to Ottawa and, and in our work at the National Right to Housing Network. We frankly hear about this in every community engagement that we hold across Canada. And then, of course, we've seen a whole bunch of research come out uh, about how Canada is losing affordable housing at a faster rate than it can possibly be produced. So that was the seven to one uh, ratio that Katie mentioned in Ottawa. Um, and this is largely because of weak housing policies, programs, regulations, and taxation measures, which really benefit private market actors rather than the people who actually need housing. Uh, and in fact, we have even seen Canada give loans and subsidies to private housing developers who then do not prioritize the creation of deeply affordable, accessible, or adequate housing to meet the needs of their communities. And so, um, I'm just going to plug, I know me and Katie have talked about this, but it's it's very frustrating because we always hear um, folks say that this is just an issue of housing supply and we just need more supply. Um, but I think there's quite frankly a clear consensus across our partners in the housing and homelessness sector that there needs to be a fundamental paradigm shift in our housing systems and in every jurisdiction to really address these issues using a rights-based approach to housing. Because ultimately only a human rights-based framework will prioritize human dignity and prioritize the goals of housing affordability, equality, inclusion, adequacy and security. And so uh, it really places value on housing as a home rather than housing as a financial asset or investment. And that's why it's it's so wonderful that the rights-based approach has been highlighted and this starts with home platform. And I'm really honored to be able to talk about how it could um, help achieve affordable and adequate housing in Ottawa and beyond. Uh, but before I dig in, I mean, I, John already introduced me, but uh, for some context, my name is Sahar. I use the pronouns she, her. And as John mentioned, uh, I'm the project manager of the National Right to Housing Network, which is a group of over 350 organizations and advocates from across the housing and homelessness sector who are dedicated to seeing the right to adequate housing meaningfully implemented across Canada. And so I just want to be clear from the get go that when we are talking about the right to housing, we are not talking about some abstract idea or, you know, just some 
fancy words. Um, really, we're referring to a concrete legal framework, which has really clear standards that have been outlined by international human rights authorities for decades. And these standards can be measured for progress. And so this is significant because Canada has recognized the fundamental right to housing for over 50 years in international law. And it has even legislated the right to adequate housing uh, as of 2019 through its National Housing Strategy Act. And so these human rights commitments that we have made actually apply to every level of government, which means that every jurisdiction, including the city of Ottawa, needs to be held accountable to these rights-based obligations. And so the fact that Ottawa and Canada more broadly have not only failed to make progress, but are actually regressing with the housing crisis worsening over time, uh, that's an outright violation of our fundamental right to housing. And ultimately, it is our government's responsibility to prioritize the dignity of its constituents and assure, ensure that people have a safe, adequate, and affordable home to rest their head at night. And frankly, I don't think this should be too much to ask in one of the world's wealthiest countries, which we have seen can respond urgently when it comes to other issues like the COVID-19 pandemic and frank, even the, the recent investments in military and defense uh, in the latest federal budget. Um, but just to dig into what these violations of the right to housing are, are really look, looking like on the ground uh, in Ottawa. I mean, I don't need to remind you folks, but uh, I'm sure we're all aware that there is a growing issue of income and housing inequality because wages have stagnated while housing prices are rising rapidly and have com been completely decoupled from income uh, because they're being driven by market interests rather than housing need. And so um, a, a lot of advocates in the sector talk about how this is really counterintuitive because Canada's GDP is growing, you know, our economy is theoretically booming, and you would expect those benefits to trickle down to the folks across the country. And yet tenancy is becoming increasingly precarious. Um, and frankly, renters are becoming a financial underclass. So uh, recent data that just came out from Statistics Canada showed that uh, multiple property owners own up to 40% of housing in most provinces across Canada. And that was before the pandemic. So we can only imagine what's happened since the pandemic when everyone who already owned homes saw huge equity gains. And so really, we're just seeing this widening gap between the haves and the have nots. More people are falling prey to housing precarity and homelessness. And ultimately, this is being driven by what lots of folks are calling the financialization of housing. And um, so this is essentially referring to the way in which housing is being treated as a profit making commodity. Um, and, and our housing system is essentially enabling wealthy investors to either extract money from the housing sector or else hoard money in the housing sector at the expense largely of folks who are in greatest housing need and and even i mean it's trickling up to the middle class at this point right a lot of folks are talking about the missing middle and so on uh, because the price of housing again has been completely decoupled from people's actual housing needs and their actual incomes and so this has had obviously incredibly damaging effects on our affordable housing stock. So as Katie mentioned, we lose seven affordable units for every one unit built in Ottawa. And that, that stat is actually a few years old, so I, I wouldn't be surprised if it's worse by now. Um, we also know that 2,400 people experience homelessness every night, and that is just visible homelessness on the streets, in shelters, in motels, but many more are inadequately housed. Um, and we, that's something we just, we don't talk about enough, and frankly, we don't have enough data on it. But this refers to folks who are living in housing that is unaffordable. So if, if it costs more than 30% of their income, uh, housing that's overcrowded, in disrepair, that's poorly located or detached from their community, employment, uh, tr public transportation, et cetera. Those are all forms of inadequate housing that are actually violations of the human right to housing. Um, and so I'll dig into some examples later using the, the Herongate case, but again, uh, a major issue in terms of the rights-based approach. And then finally, we know that over 12,000 people are on the social housing wait list, which is just obscene and, and really speaks to 
a fundamental lack of investment in social and non-market housing for decades from every level of government. And so I think that the acquisition strategy in the Starts With Home campaign is, is going to be significant in helping to start address some of these uh, issues that have been decades in the making. Um, and then of course, all of these unaffordability issues we know have discriminatory outcomes. So did, they don't affect everyone equally, and especially when it comes to evictions um, and inadequate rent and tenant protections, we know that already marginalized folks are disproportionately impacted. Um, and Herongate, again, is, is a horrific but perfect example of a largely immigrant community, uh, largely racialized, low-income tenants, families, almost 50% children uh, or kids, and um, a lot, lots of folks uh, work living and receiving uh, public assistance. Um, these folks were displaced to make room for more affluent, largely white uh, residents. Um, and again, this is a huge violation of the right to housing. Um, and so hopefully the, the ombus person that is proposed in the Starts With Home campaign can begin to address some of these egregious violations. But to, to dig in a bit to the nitty gritty of, of what we're actually talking about when, when we refer to the right to adequate housing, um, international authorities have told us that adequate housing is not just about shelter or a roof over your head, but it's about living somewhere in security, peace, and dignity. Um, and in fact, there are seven essential features to the right to adequate housing. And so um, I, I, here I will use the Herongate example just to, to exemplify how these seven features were not uh, upheld, but hopefully how an ombus person uh, in, in the city of Ottawa could assist with that. But the seven features firstly are um, legal security of tenure, which means that you must be protected from evictions. But again, in the Herongate case, we saw that uh, no alternatives to eviction or displacement were actually explored by the developer or the municipality. Um, and in fact, international human rights law says that this is a violation of human rights, that folks must be invited back to their community um, at the same rental rate that they had before the displacement and in the same type of housing. Um, and it also says that folks must be consulted before they are displaced, uh, displaced in the first place. So uh, a huge discrepancy there. Uh, then under, in, uh, under the seven features of adequate housing, your home must also be affordable. Um, so I'm not going to belabor this point because we've already discussed how unaffordable housing is becoming. But I think what's important to keep in mind here is that rents need to be controlled and must always remain connected to a household income in that community. Because again, when we talk about Herongate, 30% of uh, the original Herongate residents' income will look very different from uh, the type of folks that they wanted to replace them with, right? So we can't be using median market, uh, in, uh, medium, uh, median household incomes. We really need to be thinking about the specific context and the specific community that we are trying to house. And we would want these rent controls to be permanent because often there are just 10 to 20 years um, which is really not going to stop the loss of affordable housing in the long term. Uh, next, your home must also be accessible, habitable, and safe under human rights law, and you must have access to essential infrastructure and services like clean and safe drinking water, heating, sanitation, internet, and so on. Uh, but again, in the Herringate case, we saw that maintenance was essentially neglected from the day that Timber Creek took over uh, in 2012, um, and, and many argue that it was intentionally neglected in order to demolish it so that they could gentrify the neighborhood. And so, um, and, and in fact, I, some folks say that, that the city was also negligent in responding to some of the tenant calls uh, for maintenance. So again, here, a, a rights-based approach would look very different. Um, and then finally, Adequate housing must be located such that you have access to your community, um, necessary services and facilities like employment, education, and healthcare, and it must be culturally adequate. And so again, going back to Herongate, we know that uh, about 80 to 90 percent of residents were people of color. Um, they were immigrants. And, and I, as my bio mentioned, I'm also the daughter of immigrants. So I can speak to firsthand how, how important it is for newcomers to have access to their community for translation, for setting up bank accounts, um, for, you know, childcare and just day-to-day -day things. And the fact that 
that these folks were essentially torn from each other in this mass displacement is, is horrific and a huge violation of the right to housing. So um, all of this is to say that if the rights-based framework was meaningfully applied in this case, for example, the Herongate residents would have had a very different outcome. They would have been able to return to their community um, to the same size of housing to, at the same price. And that's really what we are trying to achieve when we are applying a rights-based approach. But the right to housing is more than just these seven essential features. Uh, you know, human rights authorities have also told us that Canada should always be making forward progress in realizing the right to housing by putting all of its available resources into realizing that basic human right. And this means not just financial investments, but also legislations to protect tenants from evictions, uh, rent and vacancy controls to rein in unaffordability issues, um, tax measures and regulations to uh, rein in speculation from corporate and private investors, and so on. Um, so, I mean, that we know that that private uh, sector developers and investors benefit from all sorts of tax loopholes and subsidies and so on. Um, human rights requires that we rein that in, that we close those tax loopholes, and that we reinvest that money back into a national housing strategy to develop more supply. So it actually could benefit us in the long run to close these loopholes. Um, it would give us more money to play with. Um, and finally, all of this is to say that it's not just about the money that we are throwing at housing, but it's also about ensuring that the investments we make are deliberate, concrete, and targeted to prioritize folks who are most marginalized and in greatest housing need. And so just to tie it all back to the Ottawa context now, I mean, we know that um, there is a federally legislated right to housing. Um, and then in the Starts With Home platform, we also see uh, folks calling for a local ombudsperson in Ottawa in order to implement the right to housing locally. And um, this, is, this is a huge move. If, if it were implemented, it would be significant because it would give us practical and effective solutions to transform a housing system, which we know currently gives rise to inequality, discrimination, and homelessness into one, which actually recognizes housing as a home and not as a commodity or a financial investment. Uh, it would demand governments and private uh, invest and investors to invest in affordable and nonprofit housing. It would require that we prioritize equality, inclusion, lived experience, and human dignity over profit or shareholder interest in a more participatory housing system. And ultimately, it would ensure that all people have access to adequate and secure housing. And so I think this ombus person, which is, um, if, if folks are familiar with the, the federal scope, uh, it's similar to the federal housing advocate. Um, they would be significant in offering independent accountability and oversight in order to ensure that the government of Ottawa is upholding its human rights obligations. And it would allow these conversations to start happening at a local level, which until now has not really been the case, given that it was a federal legislation that implemented the right to housing. So this is an important first step. It gives voice to the atrocities that are happening. Um, oop, uh, happening uh, across Ottawa, and uh, it's a voice outside of civil society, and it would have the ear of the government, which if for folks who work in civil society, many of us struggle to have, especially in the Ottawa context. Um, and so I will leave it there, but uh, just want to end by saying that I think uh, the rights-based approach that is reflected in this Starts With Home campaign can be really transformational. Uh, it could shift the balance towards right cl rights claimants, and, and it'll be significant in achieving some housing justice for the most marginalized. And so I'm really looking forward to seeing how it pans out. And thank you folks for having me. Let me just ask you uh, um, on one question. You used the word um, accountable. Uh, and the importance of keeping, uh, you know, our uh, elected leaders uh, accountable. And I'm wondering uh, how you would advise us. So we're looking at a provincial election. We're looking down the road at a municipal election. How we keep our uh, candidates uh, accountable? What kind of questions should we be asking of them? And then once they're elected, they're elected, you know, locally in terms of putting, making this uh, uh, right to housing, uh, you know, real and effective. What what should we be looking at and asking them to do? Uh, some significant human rights principles that we could uh, 
consider when we're trying to do some of this lobbying and accountability uh, is, first of all, there is a requirement that we apply a maximum of available resources to realize the right to housing. And so I think that that can directly feed into some of the asks uh, that folks are voicing across Ottawa about the need to increase uh, the municipal budget for housing um, and, and particularly to implement the for Indigenous and by Indigenous housing strategy. Um, I think for that one, we could even raise, I mean, every level of government claims to be pushing reconciliation. We have a federal, a separate federal legislation about uh, the rights of Indigenous peoples. We have UN declarations about this. I mean, at this point, the fact that we don't have a for Indigenous by Indigenous housing strategy is just egregious. So uh, I think just reminding the government of, of the um, commitments that we've made and, and reminding them that we know uh, what they are expected to do, I think, will go a long way. So John is 57 years old and resides in Ottawa, Ontario, originally from Northwestern Ontario. He developed his love of community service at a young age. In his hometown of Schreiber, he sat on many committees uh, of council, including the Parks and Recreation Committee. He also chaired the Economic Development Committee, the OPP Community Policing Committee, and a, and a major uh, community festival. Uh, John moved to Ottawa over 15 years ago and became involved with the Ottawa ACORN chapter. He joined ACORN because of uh, landlord issues. Soon after moving, he did, unfortunately developed a mobility issue and needed both hips replaced. As he waited for surgery, he realized that people with disabilities need greater representation. Consequently, he ran three times for a smaller political party in Ottawa South at the provincial level and for the Green Party in, of Canada in 2015. He also ran uh, in two municipal elections and currently advocates for better transit with the Ottawa Transit Riders Group. One of his greatest accomplishments in that capacity was successfully campaigning for an online booking system to better serve people with disabilities. So uh, John is going to talk to us about his work with ACORN and particularly around uh, the uh, Heron Gate uh, question. So please, John, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, first of all, I just want to remind that we're on the traditional territory of the Algonquin. I'm originally from the Robinson Treaty with the, uh, with the Ojibwe community. I've been on the, I've been a resident of the, of Heron Gate for now for 17 years, believe it or not. Uh, I joined ACORN because of what was just said, uh, our landlord, Transglobe, that took ownership from the Minto. Minto, originally Minto, the building was neglected and maintenance of our property. The owners, the Drimmers, were, were buying up older properties and neglecting maintenance all through Canada. CBC Marketplace did a show on the property owners and called them slumlords. A previous counselor for Alta Vista had some, so many complaints that he had to create a direct email for complaints. This all happened, this is all, the, the landlord went public and profited from his properties to several companies, including the current ownership of Timber Creek and now Hazelfield. The, the former owner is now under the name Starlight who has centered the housing market near Paul Anka Drive. Both these companies have partnered up in new developments in Toronto. The property here has become an election issue four years ago. The current council promised public input. These were, were extensive process and previous leadership of the property promised better things ahead. After, the, after this announcement, senior management team of the Timber Creek Hazelview was changed and they sort of backed off on some of these changes. Personally, I push for the protection of tenants that won't f face higher increases in the two th than the 2018 legislation. In the last two years, we saw a complaint to the city, the individual company that worked with the city, worked with stakeholders and landlord and tenants was a conflict of interest. We, we are being told this was the best deal available. As far as I know, it, no, it isn't. We're comparison. We should have got a we should have got a, a Cadillac instead. We got a Chevette. There has been two mass evictions on the property. The landlord evictions happened in the fall. Differs because the tenants were off, and the landlord differs that they got good deals because they were to offer compensation. 
after in the coming weeks or months, we'll be hearing more about about this because of the uh, Eric Acorn took the agreement that was made with the city and and the landlord to the land the land tribunal. So Hazelview and this Hazelview can be challenged. And that's basically what I'll have to say about it. I'm wondering, uh, as you uh, work uh, with, um, with with Acorn and you look at sort of perhaps other neighborhoods uh, where there might be a risk in the in the uh, in, in the city, what are your thoughts about what we can do to prevent uh, this situation uh, like, like Heron Gate arising again? Um, th the number one thing we we've, we've done was was organized, and and that was the big thing. We did get some changes through organi organizing. We got got some changes done. Um, things have improved, uh, sort of improved, under the new management team. They got a uh, like a working group with with uh, with leaders of their various organizations, but but it's mostly led by leaders from from other other organizations, but very little input from the tenants. And that's what this group is lacking, is the voice from the tenants of what's actually happening and for the hearing gate thing. And um, I think that's could be done through other, other properties right now. Mm -hmm. Are there certain things that we can do to um, better educate uh, uh, tenants, to reach out to tenants so they are aware of uh, not only perhaps uh, their rights, but how to protect those rights from your perspective? Yeah. Number one thing is language barriers. There's a lot of language barriers of what, what they can and what they can't do. And the fear of them being punished. Um, I remember when Transglobe used to own it, I used to, they would push back with uh, sending me uh, false N5s for eviction notices. Um, I was late on a payment, late payments. I still made my payment, but I was two weeks late. They was sent me a eviction notice and sent me, sent me to the landlord and tenant board. That, that kind of pushback happened. And, and it, 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 uh, God, um, the pushback sometimes got me scared, so I stopped for a while and then went. Benoit Langevin is the spokesperson for Ensemble Montreal on the issue of homelessness and youth since 2018. He's also a city councillor for the districts of District of Bois de Lies in the in the borough of Pierre Fond Roxborough since 2017. And he chairs the Ensemble Montreal Caucus since 2021. An expert in social development, he supports many causes to improve the quality of life of Montrealers. He is a pioneer in the implementation of outreach street work in the West Island of Montreal. He co-founded Action Jeunesse de Lille in 2017 and succeeded in making it one of the largest youth organizations in Quebec. He's also a recipient of the Centrate of Mont Greater Montreal's Succession Award in 2012, the Mayor's Democracy Award in 2015, and the VIVAM Montreal Citizen Award in 2016. In 2017, Benoit made the decision to move into politics, and that's where a lot of his work that we want to hear about tonight has happened. Um, in order to really pursue his mission to reduce visible and hidden homelessness across all of Montreal's boroughs. At the city level for nearly five years, Mr. Langevin has been outstanding in his ability to rally people behind a cause to advance the situation of youth and marginalized populations. He has continually made the point that homelessness is also the responsibility of the city and that we must be proactive to ensure that all people live with dignity. And that is what he has been striving to do for years now. So I will turn it over to you, Benoit. Thank you so much for the invitation, Mrs. Zaris. Uh, it's a privilege to be with all of you guys uh, tonight. Um, I uh, did a little presentation on, uh, as, as requested by uh, the organization tonight, on the preemptive rights. I'm going to focus on that and I'm going to put it out of context and in context in order for you to take it and maybe fly with it or not take it, not fly with it because you know, nothing's perfect. And if housing and if we could have a solution to homelessness, 
it would already uh, be in place and we would already have fixed uh, this uh, humanitarian crisis that uh, many cities in Canada are, are living. Montreal is a cold city. Uh, very early in my career, I realized it was uh, completely inhumane uh, to let people sleep outside and to uh, not uh, give them uh, many opportunities. Not only one, because not everybody fits in one uh, type of housing. It had to have different kind of strategies. Uh, social housing being one of them, emergency housing for some, uh, for temporary housing, it might work for uh, chronic homelessness, it might not work. Uh, so I'm going to focus on preemptive right because I decided to jump into politics and not be an advocate anymore, but actually be a policymaker uh, with a team uh, in order to really, really affect as many people as possible in my city. So the context is that in 2016, um, the uh, our party under Mr. Coderre back in the days. Uh, did an agreement with the provincial government to sign a declaration giving a special uh, denomination to Montreal being a metropolis status. Having that metropolis status um, it made it so that you could have an eye-to-eye -eye conversation with other levels of government and not being a creation of other levels of government, but to really have an impact and to really have an influence on, every, on, on whatever policies that concerns the island of Montreal, the city itself. So in this bill uh, was inserted the preemptive right. And that's what I'm gonna focus on tonight. The preemptive right, uh, considering the prices of the land was much uh, more than other municipalities and the fact that available land for development was very limited. So having that particularity, Montreal really had to um, accelerate uh, the creation of um, social housing uh, because the market was having a really strong effect on, on units, on rental units. So the preemptive rights applies to all buildings not publicly owned. So I'm gonna go through a bit of modalities of what the right, what the bill is. The city needs to adopt a bylaw on its territory and the reason for which it can be applied. The city must send a notice of liability that includes exact address, the time frame of the application. When an owner of a property on which the preemptive right has been applied wants to accept an offer, he has to send a notice of disposition to the city and the city has 60 days to let the owner know its desire to purchase the property. The city has 60 days to pay the, the owner uh, the amounts uh, of the cost. Uh, the city must also reimburse any original buyers that would have spent money on a notary or on a project uh, that the city generates a cancellation of a transaction. So the city has to reimburse the previous uh, interested, interested buyer. Since 2018, when the bylaw was created in Montreal, um, there was a bit, there was different usage in that preemptive right. Uh, there was a second bylaw in 2018 that targeted about nine or 10 different sector of Montreal where social housing would be uh, would be a balanced approach, would be uh, something that is realistic and something that would make sense. So 2019, nothing happened. 2020, the bylaw uh, that was brought forward for more spots in one sector, which is Saint Laurent for other parts. Then 2020, another bylaw for another piece of other spots where, there would be uh, places that would be interesting to uh, do the creation of social housing. So the results in 2018, the city identified 350 lots on which it applied its preemptive right for the next 10 years. And you'll see that you can have a lot of spots where you zone uh, that preemptive approach, but at the end, it's a question of money. It's always a question of money, I know, but at the same time, this tool is designed to make sure 
to have a platform so that it facilitates that creation of social housing. So in 2022, uh, what was new is that there was 30 residential lots that were included to build a stable affording housing. At the end of the day, when you think that this was an idea in 2016, and now we're in 2022, to this date, only five pieces of land have been purchased. So it's bylaws, right? But if your budget and the context of where you want to partner and what project you want to bring forward are not aligned with what the Quebec government is willing to finance, you can't go faster than Quebec, even if it sits you around the table to say, hey, there's not enough, you know? To give an example, there was 19 expropriation during the same period. So there's less of purchasing than expropriations. We are at, a, at an early stage of the application of the process, many issues, to consider with that right. One of the downside uh, was that uh, you have to think of your territory when, you come to, when it comes to application, where, where do you apply it? Uh, where the land is expensive in the areas uh, you think you wanna have, uh, or you go into cheaper areas, uh, but there's less services. So if you're not close to public transit to services, yes, the price per square feet will be cheaper, but at the same time, you have to focus on places that are central where the services are. So there's, there's really a balance and a, a serious urban planning that has to come along with that. Then there's also the politicians, us politicians. Us politicians, we want to get reelected because it's really fast. Four years, lots of subjects, lots of issues, a lot of things that you need to deal with on even topics you would never have thought you would be working on, such as the floods in Pierre Paul Roxborough, because there is natural uh, catastrophes going on everywhere. So when you think of, of politics, you have to make sure that you're not letting your politician decide where he's going to put his preemptive rights to get votes because it's popular, because he wants uh, to be uh, re-elected. So that needs to be uh, watched. You, also, you always have to bring in a bylaw that will make sure that your city never pays a certain percentage uh, compared to market value because otherwise collusion is possible. To see the result of a pre preemptive right process is fairly long, uh, as, uh, as you guys have seen in the historic that I've just presented. So that the city uh, purchase a lot, it needs to be for sale. Uh, so someone can keep, you can put a preemptive right on a piece of land and ten year, for 10 years, but the person never sells. So you have to have an idea of what you're going to target as, as property. Um, it's fairly easy for promoter to bring their business outside of Montreal or increase their price on the island, but it's very complicated for residents to move there uh, where they're attached to their neighborhood. Uh, being close to work, having their kids to local school and having access to social service is not something you can move easily. So, that's the main reason why all these measures must include all partners. You cannot just implement uh, 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 those, those preemptive rights without having the developers on board with you, having discussion with the developers and the housing group at the same time in order to find that right balance to make sure that, uh, to not prevent the creation of units on the territory. You can't be competing with what's already being built knowing that the more units that is being built, the less you, the less, uh, the more the balance is there when it comes to offer and demand and the prices can go down. So you need to have more uh, units being created in every types of housing. Uh, at the end of the day, the preemptive right doesn't allow you to buy lots, money does. Uh, the city must plan its purchase of lots. Ultimately, it must also plan how it will give it. 
The city must plan before it purchases. It must know what it will do with it. Even when the city has the budget to purchase land, transactions are not simple. For the past two years, amounts reserved by the city of Montreal to buy land aren't even fully spent. So then you need to build on these lots. Planning the funding for the construction has to be attached to a potential and land purchase. No, no one wins if the construction built in the next 10 years. In Montreal, the land purchase uh, of the city is financed with its debt. So social and affordable housing is exclusively a prerogative of the provincial government. Uh, if the province of Quebec doesn't finance social housing, Montreal is powerless. So it's a nice bylaw, but if there is no money to attach to it, nothing gets forward. It requires a political will at the provincial and federal level. The request uh, to get the preemptive right was a precise request and a potential victory for the housing groups that works in housing. But there's still a lot, uh, to, a lot of work to convince politicians at every level to make it a priority and accelerate the allocation of funds. At the end of the day, let other levels of government, uh, you can, as a municipality, create like a perfect platform in order to generate more units. But, you know, even with these policies, I want to say that the creation of new units uh, is about in the past two years, we did 40, 400 new units, which is completely insufficient in the, in the sense that we have 24,000 people waiting for social housing right now in Quebec. So uh, there, there really has to be a, 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 an acceleration. Uh, municipalities can be the platform, the administrative uh, entity to generate it but it's a question of fun. So continue mobilization, always better the arguments. And, uh, you know, he, he, that's pretty much what everybody that's listening tonight should continue doing, uh, better the arguments, make sure that you always have a good, a good uh, advocacy going and uh, make sure that you inform uh, politicians, uh, you, you get involved in the political spheres as well, because we can all be in, in the networks of community organization, in the scholar section, in it, but never mingle, never change, or never try other sectors. Uh, come to cocktails, talk to a politician, pass your messages, and that's pretty much what I have to say. <laughs> Well, thank you, Benoit. And I, I had a few people have some good questions in the Q&A just around one piece was just, you know, the preemptive right is ultimately land is going to go up for sale. And it, basically, the city has the opportunity to snag it first and basically have it. And if they want it to turn it over into social housing, is it happening that way in Montreal where it's typically social housing or nonprofit housing? Or is it actually, you know, being used for various different uses? Well, as I said, for now, being a relatively new bylaw, uh, there was two usage being uh, used. One, way, one of them was to make sure that when someone is uh, selling a, a, a house uh, on a regional park, because we have mm -hmm. massive, huge parks on the island of Montreal, and you want to make sure that it becomes public and then decide to do something else with it. That's the first kind of usage it's been used for. And the second one is... Uh, the um, social housing designation where you find areas where the square footage could be realistic and you have a certain amount coming from Quebec. And so you target, in, in, in our case in Montreal, we're at 350 spots that are ready, uh, ready for social housing in the sense that if there's money to purchase the land from the budget of the city to purchase land, and the budget necessary to build uh, units coming from the federal going down to the provincial because that's how Quebec works. And then provincial decides if it allocates the funds to this. In our case, it's Axelogie that allocates that fund to that, to that project. The one piece you said was it's in its infancy. We fought really hard for this bylaw to become a reality. And in you know, the Starts With Home campaign, we're advocating that this is one tool to make sure we don't lose buildings that are aging that could be scooped up by the private sector. And so you had said, um, 
at the time, you know, lots of gray areas. <laughs> what are the things that we could make it the ideal? So if you had one or two recommendations for Ottawa, were the city of Ottawa to take this on, what would you say, here's the thing I would really try and focus on first um, to make sure that it's done well and is gonna get people who most need that deeply affordable housing that you're speaking to? I think that the city has a role to one, uh, work on its dying uh, infrastructure in the sense that um, sometimes there's a lot of available unit, but a quarter, one third, in our case, it's one third of the park that we have that needs renovation and that is not being used right now. So one area is, is there. Uh, one of the key elements is to renovate and to invest in our dying infrastructure for social housing. The other element is to push in uh, those types of bylaws so that the municipality, not only through the bylaw it presents, but also the fact that it, it puts pressure on other levels of government when your biggest city or the city that is, is, is you know, um, hiring a lot of people, that is an economic boom, that is, is really going well, you want it to look good as well. So if your municipality is all in favor of renovating, it's also sending a message to other levels of government that if social, if social housing is a priority, it will come with investment and they at the provincial government will put pressure on the, on the federal government uh, to really put the money back they you know, they took 15 years ago and never put back in the sense of keeping it going and making sure everybody would be housed in Canada. Does the preemptive right, how does it affect property values? And especially in that piece, if somebody has to offer it to the city first, um, does the amount, do they just put a really high bid, which the city's never going to be able to afford, and then it goes down when it goes to the private market? Or how does that work? Well, well, if somebody, if you're, you're putting down a preemptive right, it has to come with a bylaw that says that you're not going to pay more than, you're not going to put more public money into something that is 30, 40% higher than market value. So you have to find that balance in a way. And sometimes you can lose a sale or you know, have to, to not take it on. But um, in another way, it can also tell the owner that he secured a sale. So no, you're not going to be able to get all the targeted areas you're looking for, but you're definitely um, the first sale. So the person is sure to sell, but um, so it's a, it's a positive thing in a sense. Um, if it's, the person then tries to make more money out of public money, then you have 350 other spots. Like I said, the city was able to purchase five in the last, uh, in the last two years. So if the city can purchase only five of those preemptive spots, well, obviously they're going to select the ones that make sense uh, to build. There's some great questions coming into the chat. And actually, I think um, maybe I'll, I'll separate them, one for you, John, and one for you, uh, Sahar. But um, one is just around where Herringate is at right now in terms of a legal challenge. Is there anything further happening, John? I know they've signed the Memorandum of Understanding, but is there some kind of class action happening? Or is it at this point that's been signed, the, the development is moving forward? Sarah, I think you can answer that. but. Um... Um, about a week and a half ago, there was uh, they they went to the landlord and tenant board, and the the legal team that's representing Acorn um, was went for straight forward to them and asking asking about about the human rights aspect of 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 the uh, of the application, and uh, and it could lead also lead to the to lead to the master plan as well. For the municipality, so it will have complicated. It will have greater complications down the road, and probably master plans for the whole province. 
but just broadly, so many red evictions involve the mass displacement of racialized communities, including people of color, single parents, seniors, and people with disabilities, all groups that have code protected status. Um, so Rob's wondering, you know, if any advocacy group has considered taking on a class action at the Human Rights Tribunal um, to address evictions through the lens of human rights. And part of my understanding, um, and Sahar, you are here to correct me and clarify this, is that that's part of the work that is happening with the federal housing ombudsperson. Um, so is that some of the work moving forward or has some of that already happened? Um, any context you can provide would be great. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's it's in the early stages at the federal level. So for, for folks who don't know about that context, we had the federal housing advocate appointed just uh, in February, and they just started their official role in April. And so their whole job will be similar to the ombudsperson in the sense that they can receive claims about systemic issues like this mass displacement issue that we're seeing across Canada. Um, and then they'll investigate and then they can either um, send recommendations directly to the relevant federal ministers or uh, can refer the issue to a review panel where there will literally be an open hearing for the public to participate and to hear it. And I think the process in itself is a form of accountability because it makes uh, the issue visible to folks across the country. Um, but yeah, we are pursuing the opportunity to to bring forward a case. And actually, if any folks are doing any work in this uh, space, please feel free to reach out to us at the, at the National Right to Housing Network. Um, would love to make this a collaborative submission because the more people we have behind it, the stronger um, it will be. Um, and, and just to speak to the federal context as well, uh, the interesting thing is that once the advocate or the review panel give recommendations to the federal government, they are legally required to respond via uh, a response in Senate and the House of Commons within 120 days. So even uh, in the Ottawa context, it would be interesting if this was implemented in a way where the Ottawa city councillors or, um, you know, uh, mayor are required to respond to really uh, cement that accountability. Vesa Whitmore has uh, raised the issue that in a city like Ottawa, um, you know, where we tend to be, uh, you know, there's a, there's a split, of course, between the the, the urban councillors and the suburban and rural rural councillors, with you know a, a preponderance of the with a larger number of councillors being from suburban and rural areas. I guess Haringey is an award that sometimes thinks it's urban and sometimes thinks it's suburban. But in any case, I'm wondering about that that kind of tension, uh, you know, where councillors from different parts of the city may see the issues differently. You know, how do we kind of get a, a common sense of uh, a purpose around the need for affordable housing and for, you know, uh, for, uh, for, for, for fair access to housing. Yeah, that, that's always a dilemma because they re they represent that that Pacific area and it's hard to to sell the idea of from another area that uh, that there is issues here. And it's, it's a fr frustrating thing to try to explain to them that uh, we need affordable housing here and and it's try to explain that to someone that that is being voted by a, uh, someone that's making over one hundred twenty thousand dollars a year <laughs> telling you so that, that, that telling that somebody's make, making me like uh, during the during the pandemic, I made almost twenty two thousand dollars because I'm mean on on ODSP. And and speaking of ODSP too, well, um, we only get so much for a housing allowance, and I'm on market rent, so I have to so I have to figure out how much do I have to make the difference to just to pay on pay it, pay it, and we're only allowed to make a maximum of uh, two hundred dollars per month. Plus, we're we're crunched. If we make over two hundred dollars a month, we're deducted 50 cents for every dollar out of our monthly our monthly income so it's kind of frustrating to try to make make and things meet when you're when you're when you're a single person on on disability benefits making 1186 a month i honestly so i'm not from ottawa so i can't speak to the specific context but uh, i do know that because of the increasing unaffordability in the city, I would be curious to see how things pan out as people start 
um, moving into those rural areas and, and how the, the values and uh, priorities of those city councillors will change because we actually just hosted a, a webinar a week ago on housing in rural remote northern areas and, and they experience equally bad if not worse on affordability issues because they get much less funding uh, to build housing and uh, so on. So um, yeah, don't have an answer there other than that I do think the human rights framework applies to anyone who's in inadequately housed and I imagine that we might see it uh, play out more in the rural areas over time. One of the pieces too that you spoke to in, in your presentation as well, John, was around the quality, right? So having an apartment is one thing, but then having that be taken care of by a landlord is another piece. And I'm wondering if, if Sahar, you might be able to speak to what that looks like in a rights-based approach at a local level. So if we did have a housing ombudsperson, how will that help protect tenants um, to preserve the quality of the existing apartment or housing that they do have? Um, what does that look like? Is it a tenant submitting requests or what sort of process would people have to go through? Yeah, I mean, ideally, um, these kinds of processes, we don't want to make it a bureaucratic nightmare such that people don't want to engage with them. And we already know that landlord tenant boards nine out of 10 times end up in the favor of the landlord after tons of effort from the tenant, you know, time, energy, money. Uh, we know that courts are not a great avenue. And so I actually I actually think that an ombuds person or the federal housing advocate is a much lower barrier option to, to bring forward a complaint. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it could look like an individual complaint perhaps, but I know that in the federal context, what we're really going for is that people bring forward systemic issues, things that affect many people. And that way, it's not like you and on the line for this one issue with this one landlord, but everybody can achieve justice at once without any one person taking on the burden of the claim. Um, and so, um, you know, what that could look like would be having, you know, like having the ombus person push for a right to remain uh, or a right to return or a right to retain housing rather than being uh, displaced or evicted um, out of your community. Um, yeah, I mean, and, and I think uh, uh, what an ombus person, the value that they would bring is that they would really focus on lived experience and dignity of people. I don't mean to like keep beating a dead horse, but I think that's just something that is lost in the bureaucracy of, of government uh, sometimes. And, and that would be, I think, the, the main value they add. One of the pieces too, John, that you had raised around the master plan and what ACORN's trying to do in terms of challenging um, displacement in a significant way, you know, what would city policy and planning look like if we had an ombudsperson and a policy lens that says housing is a human right, displacement is not okay, we have to respond to if people are going to be displaced, we actually have appropriate, safe, affordable spaces. Um, and I guess I'm just wondering, how can that potentially change planning? Like, what does that look like when those sorts of decisions come to council? Um, and is that line of accountability um, kind of preemptive and that it's not, it's not just happening after the fact, but where does it sort of start in terms of trying to get ahead of, of challenges like that? First of all, I think, think it has to, uh, it will change the fact that um, they have to appoint, uh, direct a certain amount of development for each developer, a, a certain amount of percentage uh, to, to, to these individuals. And it, and probably the um, thing what's a good, uh, a good example is the, uh, we did the federal land study on the, the property right across the street from here in Gate, the study center, the federal study center. I was part of the working group there. And uh, the minimal, the maximum amount of queried by the federal government for affordable housing on those properties are 10%. And I was able to lobby to, for, for the presentation, uh, it was, it has moved up to 20% to affordability. So that's something that we can, can we work on to make it, uh, make it even even greater i want to see it higher to be honest with you because it's on federal lands and the fact that it is um a municipal might have to do, change their all their policies concerning it and make something available for a, 
uh, hopefully a, a, a max their amount and more friendlier towards social housing. I think your point, John, of it should be matching targets, right? <laughs> we should have goals and we should be matching our standards to what those goals are to make sure people have housing. The city determined a few years ago various categories of land it owns for suitability for social housing. Um, what is the status of turning these options into reality? So I can speak to a bit of what I know for that, but I don't know if, John, you may have a better sense of it. My understanding was there was about 20 parcels identified. I think to this point, 17 have been used. I wouldn't be able to speak to the why and the how of what has been used so far and why, but if, if other folks want to chime in, please feel free. It was the baseball stadium, but uh, now there's a professional ball, ball team going into there. That's the hell of the table. Okay. So... so. So not necessarily social housing, but yeah. And certainly the Breton would be one of those. And there isn't a social housing contract in there, which is good. Um, yeah, I think any other, any other final thoughts from Sahar, John, if you have any kind of final pieces you want to leave with folks? Um, I can flag one thing, which is just um, if any of you folks were watching the federal budget, they announced this housing accelerator fund, which is meant to, for municipalities to speed up the development of housing and so on. Um, there were no affordability guidelines attached to it and so on. So I would say if folks want something practical to advocate for right now, it would be to make sure those funds are used in, in a way that is rights-based and affordable and so on. Um, yeah, as a first step. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for mentioning that. I think pushing, continuing to push all levels of government is going to be really key on this issue. We thank you both so much. And I know Benoit is, is off now um, doing some hard work in his ward, but thank you for, for coming tonight, for sharing just your expertise. And I think just sort of in pulling all these pieces together, you know, we titled this tonight, Stop the Loss. Um, and it really is these many different pieces. The fact that we have an out of control housing market um, where people just cannot afford to live. Um, the fact that 30% of people in Canada rent and renting is increasingly precarious. And what you had said, Sahar, just about a growing underclass, you know, do we have people who really just cannot access affordable housing? Um, so we really encourage, we know this takes public and political will. The solutions that are outlined in the Starts With Home platform are meant to tackle these pieces. Preemptive right, so that we can actually get land and existing buildings that are going to be probably demolished or lost to the private market, um, that they actually come under the fold of nonprofit housing, city buying them, turning them over to the nonprofit sector. If that had happened with Herringate and Timber Creek slash now Hazelview was not renovating, demolishing and displacing over 500 people, um, what would that look like? We have another one coming up, Manor Park, um, not Manor Park, mm -hmm. Manor Village. Um, and Manor Village is another community where I think there's over 300 folks who, because of the, the location of the new transit system, um, they're also, their community is going to be um, displaced. And so that's coming up in three to five years. There's still an opportunity to change the direction of that. There's still an opportunity to advocate for anti-displacement policies. Um, and I think pulling these pieces together, ensuring that we have a housing as a human right lens as kind of the under, under foundation of all of the way we think about housing policy at a local level can be really powerful. Um, so we wanna do that because we wanna get, we need to get 20,000 people. That is our goal to Katie. endorse this campaign. Katie. Yeah. Yeah, Can I, um, the councillor in that ward is not running, so there's an opportunity there. <laughs> there's, and a lot of people are announcing that they want to run, so that's it, right? We want to build strength in numbers, um, just like many of you are advocates, you're doing that already. Can we have a unified approach and say to the next council, it is a priority that we are ending homelessness in the city, that we are making sure everyone has affordable housing. Um, and so we've outlined kind of six pieces that we think can help us get there not the full package, we know we need many more, but we wanna start that and we wanna make that um, build on the activism that's been happening for years, but have a unified voice to the next city council that this should and needs to be a priority. So thank you everyone for coming and a huge thank you to the team at Ottawa U. You've put all of this together on the back end and done all the tech, which is a huge, huge gift. So thank you. Um, Sahar and John, we really appreciate just your expertise and your willingness to come tonight. Um, and I'm, I'm going to sign us off from there. So thank you everyone for coming.
Before you do, Katie, I just want to say thank you to you and the Alliance for your leadership uh, on this campaign and encourage people to uh, have a look at the campaign and to reflect on those themes and make it help us to make it a part of the, uh, the conversation that's going to happen around the upcoming municipal election. So thanks to you and the Alliance. Thanks. Giant team effort. <laughs> yeah. That's the whole community. So thank you for inviting me. Yeah, thank you guys for, for hosting this. Mm -hmm. Take care, everyone. Take care. Good evening, everyone.